Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us at Indian Springs Metro Park Environmental Discovery Center for a virtual field trip. My name is Melanie and this is Jill and Jessica. We are interpreters with Huron Clinton Metro Parks, whose job it is to connect visitors like you to your Metro Parks and share knowledge about the natural world. In this program, we are bringing you along on the nature trails to investigate and explore ecosystems with us. Indian Springs Metro Park is located in White Lake, Michigan. Here in the park, people can experience and enjoy the variety of habitats found in Southeast Michigan. These different areas we call ecosystems. But what actually is an ecosystem? Think about all the things around you. Some are living, such as plants, animals, people. We call these biotic factors. Together, these living things form a community. There are also non-living things we call abiotic factors, like rocks, water, air, wind, and sunlight. If you take both the biotic and abiotic parts of an area and see how they interact with each other, you have an ecosystem. Three ecosystems we will explore in this program are wetlands, forest, and prairie. Hi. I'm Jill Martin. Today we're here at Indian Springs Metro Park exploring wetlands. A wetland is an ecosystem that has soil that contains water for most or part of the year. There are different kinds of wetlands, um, but all of them can hold a lot of water, almost like a sponge. Wetlands can soak up a lot of water and hold on to it. They stay wet for a long period of time, providing water for the plants and animals that call them home. Here at Indian Springs, we have many different kinds of wetlands that you can visit in one day. We're going to be exploring lots of those, and then we're going to look at a fen wetland in depth. Let's get started. Here we are at the marsh ecosystem. A marsh is a wetland that is characterized by cattail plants growing all around it. Here's some cattails here. Here's a cattail flower that's gone to seed. It has lots of these seeds that will be dispersed in the wind to go grow new cattail plants. These cattails are great for habitat and food for lots of different animals. I thought I'd pop in to tell you about the pond here. This pond is full of water during the whole year. Its permanent pond status makes it a great spot for things like fish and ducks and turtles, all kinds of creatures to live. If you look around the edges of this pond, you're going to see there's a lot of vegetation. Things like cattails and shrubs, those emergent plants help keep the pond clean and for the casual observer like ourselves, it gives us a clue that this is a healthy pond. A healthy pond always has vegetation around the edges. Another type of pond is a vernal pond. Vernal means springtime, and so this vernal pond almost always has water in it in the spring. Sometimes it has water during other times of the year as well, if there's been a lot of rain, for instance. A vernal pond doesn't have a natural source of water besides so in the hotter months, the water evaporates or infiltrates into the soil, and what is a pond right now might just look like a, a low area with some grass growing in it. Because this pond dries up during parts of the year, there's certain animals you don't see. Things like fish, for instance, they don't have legs to carry them to another body of water. However, for turtles and salamanders and different species of frogs, this is a great place to live. In vernal ponds, you even find specific tiny creatures called fairy shrimp, and they only occur in vernal ponds. Here we are at another wetland. This one has tall hardwood trees, and it's called a swamp. A wetland with trees is a swamp. This one has maple and beech trees, um, as well as lots of standing water. If you look behind me, you'll see these vernal pools of water. The standing water, it's here in the spring, which is what the vernal refers to, like spring equinox. But in the fall, if we have a lot of rain, um, sometimes in the winter if the snow melts, you get a lot of standing water. So the plants here are adapted also to wet conditions. 
We're here out at the Huron River. A river is a body of water that's flowing. Um, this particular river is called the Huron River. It starts up here in the Huron Swamp. All of these wetland areas hold water um, when it rains or when the snow melts and that water gradually um, seeps into the soil just so far and eventually follows the underground topography so that it, the water ends up in the river. This river starts here in White Lake in the Huron Swamp and it will traverse southeast Michigan, eventually emptying out into Lake Erie. Out here we are at Timberland Lake. A lake is a body of water um, that's at least eight acres in area. So it's a pretty big body of water. You can have a smallish lake like this one. They can range all the way to the size of the Great Lakes. A lake is a great habitat for things like turtles, as well as lots of different species of fish. We've arrived at the Fen. A Fen is a wetland that gets its groundwater as a source of the moisture in the soil. This groundwater is very high in minerals like magnesium and calcium. So the plants that live here have to be specially adapted to those conditions. Often Fens occur right next to another body of water. This could be a lake or a river. Sometimes they even occur at the base of a hill where the groundwater seeps out from the hill to replenish um, the, the wetland moisture. The plants here, like I mentioned before, they have special adaptations. I like to say that the plants at a fen, really at any wetland, they like to have wet feet. Their roots are adapted to being submerged underwater for most of the year and then their leaves emerge out into the air and they reach the sun where they can do photosynthesis. The main emergent plants here that you see behind me and beside me are sedges and also rushes. Sedges are the, the skinnier ones that look like, um, that look more like grass. They have more of a folded or triangular stem. Rushes are the round, thicker ones, they have more of a circular stem. Sedges and rushes um, both provide food for herbivores and insects, and they, uh, they really characterize the wetland. Now there are other shrubs, such as dogwood, that sometimes occur near different fens, and there's trees, like tamarack trees. You can see the tamaracks behind me, they look like pine trees, um, but they're a deciduous pine tree. That means they lose their needles every fall. Their needles are starting to turn yellow right now. Um, pretty soon they're going to drop those needles and when spring comes they're going to grow some brand new needles as well. We have other plants um, that grow out here, flowering plants, such as the carnivorous pitcher plant and also fringed gentian, which is a really nice purple color. Lots of animals use this location. Um, animals that are, are mammals include things like a mink or the white-tailed deer. Um, they all um, go through this area both to find water as well as to find habitat. Things like reptiles and amphibians use this area as well. This is even a hibernacula for some Massasauga rattlesnakes. In Michigan, the Massasauga rattlesnake is a threatened species, um, federally listed as a, a threatened species, and in Michigan it's a species of special concern. So this rattlesnake is our only rattlesnake and our only venomous snake in Michigan. Um, we feel pretty fortunate that we can have them out here. Um, it means this habitat is in, in really good ecological condition. Let's review what we learned about wetlands on our journey today. We found out that wetlands contain water during all or part of the year. They have saturated soils and they hold moisture for long periods of time. They provide habitat for lots of different animals. The seven wetlands we saw today are the marsh, which is characterized by cattails, the pond, which has water during all of the year, the vernal pond, which has a body of water during most of the year, but it does dry up during the drier seasons. We saw a river that had flowing water. We saw a swamp, which was a wetland with hardwood trees. We saw the fen, 
which was a wetland characterized by sedges and rushes. We also saw the lake, which is a larger body of water. Each one of these had their own unique characteristics, but they were all different types of wetland. They're a very important feature in Michigan's natural areas. Welcome everyone, my name is Jessica. And in this clip, I'm going to teach you a little bit more about the woodlands we have at Indian Springs Metro Park. So woodlands are areas dominated mostly by trees and shrubs, as you can see around me. Uh, when an area has enough tree cover that it blocks out most of the sunlight, we would call this a forest. I want you to take a second, look and listen, see what you notice about the forest that I'm standing in right now. To help you understand how forests are systems, I'm gonna break this part of the video up into parts. Look for vocabulary words like canopy, understory, shrub layer, herbaceous layer, and forest floor. These are the levels of a temperate forest, and they're very important for the functioning of a healthy forest ecosystem. So let's start from the top. The highest level of the forest is the canopy. This is where the treetops meet the skyline and where you'll find the most sunlight. Sunlight is important in any ecosystem because plants use sunlight to create food and oxygen through a process called photosynthesis. The animals in the forest then depend on these plants for food. In forests though, sunlight can be a limited resource since thick canopies tend to block light from reaching the levels below. So not all trees make it to the top. Our next level, the understory, is where our smaller trees that are still growing can be found, or even some shade tolerant trees that spend their entire lives uh, down below in the understory. Now, some trees, the ones that are still growing, may spend decades uh, waiting for that perfect opportunity for one of the larger uh, canopy trees to die and leave an opening uh, for sunlight to come through. At that point, you may have several trees suddenly burst up and growing at once, and only one or two can be the winner. Now, the understory is important because it provides cover for animals. Some animals you might find in the understory include squirrels, raccoons, um, maybe even bats under the bark of certain trees. My favorite part of the understory, though, are the nesting birds that you can hear singing throughout it. I'm going to cover two levels in this part, our shrub layer and our herbaceous layer. So shrubs are plants with woody stems, kind of like a tree. One example is the spice bush uh, shrub that I have here. Uh, when you rub its leaves or bark, it smells a little bit lemony, and that's a defense against animals that might want to eat it. Herbaceous plants are those with soft stems like a flower, and often they're found growing close to the forest floor. These layers survive with very little sunlight for most of the year. In early spring, though, the herbaceous level takes the spotlight. Michigan forests at this time are filled with spring wildflowers that bloom while there's still a chill in the air, but they disappear again once the sunlight does. But this layer is mostly dominated by ferns, mosses, sedges, and certain grasses that thrive in high humidity and low light. The higher humidity here is caused by the trees that block out the sunlight. They also reduce airflow, meaning that the air and the ground beneath it dries at a much slower rate than anything up above the trees. Our final level is the forest floor. And just like its name suggests, it's the ground level of our forest. This is where you can find all of the dead and decaying plant matter uh, from the forest. So decomposers are the bacteria, fungus, and invertebrates that you can find underneath the leaves, in logs such as the one in front of me, um, and even on the sides of trees. And they work by eating uh, or consuming the the dead and decaying matter and breaking it back down into nutrients that can be used by the plants growing above. So this log here you can see 
is breaking down into what will become soil. Other animals that you may find on the forest floor are things like um, snakes, shrews, Sometimes you may even find a moth or butterfly, such as the morning cloak butterfly. Uh, these animals use the, the leaves to help protect themselves during the winter. So let's recap what we learned about forests. Forests are ecosystems with dense tree cover. Often these trees will block out the sunlight available to the, the stories below. The levels of a forest include the canopy, the understory, the shrub layer, the herbaceous layer, and the forest floor. The soils in a forest are often moist and have high levels of organic material from the leaf fall above. Forests are also home to a variety of amphibians, uh, birds, and mammals. Thank you for joining me as we explore the forest. Now, on to your final ecosystem. Hey everybody, it's Melanie. In this video, we'll be investigating the prairie ecosystem. You've already seen the wetland and forests. You've seen emergent plants, trees, water sources, and probably a flatter landscape. Let's see how the prairie compares. Here we are in the prairie ecosystem. What do you notice about the landscape? Let's take a look and a listen too. A prairie is an area of land made up mainly of grasses and wildflowers rather than trees. They're typically in lowland interior areas with rolling hills such as the ones you see here in the park. They're similar to grasslands such as the Great Plains in the central United States. Did you know that we have prairie ecosystems here in Michigan too? Because of their central locations away from oceans, they experience a variety and range of temperatures and wind speed as you might have noticed. While the prairie is mainly grasses and wildflowers, it isn't made up of just one type of grass or wildflower. Look at the different heights and shapes of the plants. There is a lot of plant diversity out here in the prairie. Some of the native grasses in the prairie area are taller big blue stem or turkey foot, Indian grass, a medium height little blue stem, and a shorter grass, side oats grandma. Plants in the prairie have adapted to living in a dry, sunny, windy ecosystem. They've developed deep roots that extend far into the ground. This helps anchor the plants in place, find water when water is scarce, and hold the soil in place so it doesn't wash or blow away. Check out one of the coolest plants we have here at Indian Springs, the compass plant. It's the tallest plant in the prairie. This one measures in over eight feet tall, but what we can't see is how far the roots extend into the ground. The compass plant's roots travel down 10 to 15 feet into the ground. Take a look at this chart comparing different prairie plants and their root depths. Pause the video to find out what plant has the most shallow or the shortest roots, what plant has the deepest or the longest roots, and a plant that has roots as deep as you are tall. You might have noticed a few small patches of trees here and there. That's because this prairie is also known as an oak savanna or oak barrens, where in addition to open grassy areas, we see parts of the forest ecosystem present too. Black oak and white oak trees are typically found in Michigan oak barrens. During the warmer months, the prairie is alive with color from many wildflowers. In the summer, Bee balm and milkweed attract many pollinators, especially monarch butterflies. At the end of summer and early fall, the grasses add more golden color to the landscape along with the last of the flowers, yellow from goldenrod and some white and purple color from aster flowers. The abundance of wildflowers makes perfect habitat for many insects, mostly seen during the warmer summer months. However, if you look closely, you can still find evidence of the insects that call this ecosystem home in the winter or cold weather. If you take a close look at this goldenrod stem, you might notice that there's a bulge or ball 
No, the plant isn't sick, and no, it didn't swallow anything. This is called a gall, and it's because the plant responded to an insect that laid its eggs on it. The plant stem grows around the eggs, encasing them to protect the larva inside. And once the larva hatch out, they have a place to spend the winter safe and sound. That is, unless a bird or hungry critter comes by for a good snack of protein. This gall is called a ball gall, and the insect inside is a goldenrod gall fly. You can see in this area that the prairie borders the forest. This area is called an edge habitat since the edge of the prairie meets the edge of the forest. Many animals share forest and prairie habitat and use this space to travel between the two in search of food and shelter, such as deer, coyotes, snakes, and birds. If you walk along the trails, you might be able to notice some small pathways where the grass is matted down, such as this one here. You might have thought maybe somebody walked off the trail, but to make this, they might have had to crawl on their hands and knees since the top of the grass isn't parted as much as the bottom. Think about it, what might have actually made this trail? That's right, the animals that call the park home. You can guess what kind of animal might have made this trail by the size of the trail. If it's smaller than your shoe, it was probably from a mouse or a vole. If it's a little bit larger, it might have been from a deer or a coyote. The prairie here at Indian Springs is actually a restored prairie. What was once just a field after settlers came in and cleared the land for farming, work was done by the Metro Parks to bring back the prairie ecosystem to provide habitat for native plants and animals that have since returned to the area. The prairie is home to many species of insects, reptiles, birds, and mammals. You learned about one really special animal we have here in the park, the Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake, during your wetland hike. While they spend their winters hibernating in crayfish burrows in the wetland areas, during the hot summer months, they move into the prairie ecosystem that's nearby, soaking up the hot sun to move around and to hunt for mice and voles. Let's review what we've observed in the prairie ecosystem today. There is a lot of biodiversity in this ecosystem, especially when it comes to grasses, wildflowers, and insects. The ecosystem with rolling hills, lots of open space, gives way to a wide range of temperatures and wind speeds. Thank you so much for joining us on our ecosystem investigation at Indian Springs Metro Park. We challenge you to take a closer look at the environment around you and see what observations you can make in your own backyard, schoolyard, or nearby nature and compare it to the ecosystems here at Indian Springs Metro Park. We encourage you to come out to visit any of your 13 Metro Parks and explore more on the trails as there's so much to see all year long. Check out metroparks.com slash virtual for many different activities and fun educational videos. You can also visit metroparks.com for more information on Indian Springs and all the other Metro Parks. Thanks for watching.